Um, I only ever saw that commercial one time. Um, it was played during the 2022 Super Bowl, the one that got away. Yeah, I see James back there celebrating his Rams, beating our Bengals at that one. Uh, but I thought it was a brilliant social commentary on America today. As society, we've lost the ability to argue or disagree about anything graciously. It's not just enough to disagree with someone. You have to burn the whole thing to the ground and take no prisoners. I mean, it's just crazy, right? I don't even know if you're allowed to have debate teams in high school anymore. They should, they should probably be called cancel clubs or something, right? But we live in a world, and more specifically, in a country that doesn't value opinions or points of view unless they line up with your own, unless they're your own point of view. We've forgotten or unlearned the ability to have a peaceful disagreement. And the reality is we're not going to agree with everybody's opinion or viewpoint that we come into contact with, and believe me, we shouldn't. But we shouldn't necessarily be so quick to dismiss others either. And in both cases, I'm not just talking about people outside of the church either. There are people inside the church, inside of this church, sitting around you right now, watching online right now, that have a different opinion than you do about something. Heck, I probably have a different opinion about things than you do. And the same... <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Crazy. Mind, mind blown. But the same guardrail should apply there too. We shouldn't, we shouldn't agree with everybody's opinion, even inside the church, about everything. But at the same time, we shouldn't be so quick to dismiss everybody either. It's a fine line, and it can be like walking on a tightrope sometimes. Now, before we get too further uh, into the message, as Tim mentioned, my name's Mike Birch, and I have the privilege of serving as one of the elders here at Bridgetown Church of Christ. I also have the privilege of serving as our uh, resident Canadian here at the church. I grew up in Niagara Falls, Ontario, Canada. I moved here in May of 2004, uh, married my beautiful wife, and I became a citizen of the United States in January of 2018. Now, I don't know how relevant or necessary any of that was, but I say all that to say I grew up in the city of Niagara Falls. And so the city, especially the really touristy part of it, is just enveloped in history. Um, I used to, actually in high school, I worked at a museum called the Niagara Falls Museum. It was this old four-story building. Quite honestly, only the bottom floor had anything to do with Niagara Falls. The rest was a random hodgepodge of stuff. Uh, yeah, that's a different a story for a different time. Um, but they had replicas of things that people used to go over the falls and stuff. And so growing up in the city, one of the lessons that you learn is about, how, about the people that went over the falls in a barrel or some other contraption. But you also learn about how people walked across Niagara Falls on a tightrope. Now, across the falls may be a bit of a misnomer, actually. Um, in the 1800s, there were eight people who walked a tightrope across the Niagara Gorge, which is near the falls. And so the gorge is a really long canyon that the Niagara River runs through. But the first person to actually cross over Niagara Falls in a tightrope was a man named Nick Walenda. And on June 15, 2012, he walked across the Horseshoe Falls. I have a picture of the Horseshoe Falls there. So he literally crossed from one country to the other across those Horseshoe Falls. Now, you can call me bias if you want. But having seen the falls from both sides, the Canadian side is a whole lot prettier. Just going to put that out there. And thing, I'm getting some agreement. So, so we do agree on some things, evidently. That's good. Oh, and, and again, we don't. See? Exactly. So as Christ followers, we too are walking a daily tightrope. And sure, it's not as exhilarating. It doesn't garner as much attention. And it maybe not lead us to physical danger like what Nick Walenda does. But it definitely can put us in spiritual peril. See, for quite a few months now, through prayer, through the reading of scripture, through reading books, through many conversations that I've had with many different people, this is what God has put on my heart. We are daily walking a tightrope, balancing truth and grace. And several months ago, Nathan reached out to me and he asked if I would preach this week, and I said, sure, no problem, I'm happy to do it. And he said, it's a one-off, uh, you know, the sky's the limit, see where God leads you. And I had no idea that this was where God was leading me, but I'm confident that this is the teaching that God's put on my heart to share today. I've been blessed with several opportunities to, to preach here uh, many times over the years, and I, I hope to again in the future. I guess today could be a, the end of it for me. Who knows? Um, I hope not. But each time I pray and I seek God's direction, and he comes through each and every time. And this message, I don't even know how to explain this other than I sat down at my computer after reading and preparing and studying and putting together an outline. And I feel like God just like reached down from heaven and said, this, this is it, Mike. This is what I want you to say. And it's going to be hard. I threw up this morning before I came out here. I'm not making this up. But it's, it's what needs to be said. 
And so God has put this on my heart for months now, and that's true. But what's also true is that I've been wrestling with this idea of balancing truth and grace for as long as I've understood it. And through multiple conversations with other people, I realize I'm not alone in this. It's a really, really hard thing to figure out. I wear a lot of different hats in my life. I'm a husband, a father, a son, a friend, a teacher, an elder, just to name a few. And in each of these instances, my overarching identity is found in Christ as one of his followers. I know the charge has been put on my life to live in this place where I stand for God's truth and I show God's love to others. And I just struggled so hard to find the words. And I prayed, and I prayed, and a few weeks ago, I'm sitting at my dining room table, and I'm, I'm doing my daily reading of Scripture, and God starts illuminating this to me. See, my favorite verses in the Bible for years have been 1 Corinthians 16, 13 through 14. And as often as I've read them, they never jumped off the page quite like they did a few weeks ago. And just as a quick side note, I can't say enough about the value of investing yourself in Scripture and reading Scripture and studying Scripture because... It, it changes every time you read it. It, it's, it shows you something new each and every time you read it. Like when you finish reading the Bible, open it again and start over because you're going to get hit differently this time. I, 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 it really is a life-changing book like that. And so 1 Corinthians 16, 13 through 14 says this, Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. So like I said, I've read this a hundred times, but it jumped off the page. It's like I'd never read it before. See, it's not just myself and the other elders and the staff here at BCC. We all need to be watchful because the enemy's prowling and looking to distort things. And we need to be watchful because there's false teachers out there that are presenting lies as truth. We need to stand firm in the faith because the world is sinking sand and the shifting ideas of the world will sway you. In the, in the New Testament, the, the, word, the Greek word used is androzomai. I practice that all week, so I think I got it. It, means, it literally means to be brave. And we're to be brave in defending the truth because we are going to be battling each and every day. We all have coworkers and neighbors and family members and other relationships in our lives where the truth is misrepresented, misinterpreted, and straight up distorted. And we're called to defend and protect that truth. We need to be strong because we're going to face trials. The truth is unpopular. And we need to be strong to not give in to the false teachings and to know that the truth that we live by it's, it could become the latest victim of cancel culture. And all that's written there in verse 13. And then in verse 14, it says, let all that you do be done in love. The watchfulness, the bravery, the strength that I might show, that you might show, it means nothing without love. You and I, all of us, we're called to do these things in a meek, humble spirit of love. Protect and defend the truth. Watch, stand firm in faith, be brave and strong, but also do this all with a spirit of love. And that's the rub. That's, that's what's been just uh, getting on my case, maybe, for the last, how long I've been doing this. How do I balance this? How do I walk this thing out? How do I walk this tightrope of protecting and defending the truth, but doing all of this in love? Because, see, the word or isn't an option. Our personality, our upbringing, and several other factors will usually cause us to lean in one direction or the other. And grace people, they're pleasant to be around. They don't ruffle any feathers. They cut us a lot of slack. They're easygoing. They accept us for who we are. They don't make demands. They're always welcoming. Without truth, grace isn't really grace. It's just being accepting and nice. Grace people without truth, like I said, they're pleasant. They're tolerant. But often they don't know the difference between right and wrong. Or maybe they just don't want to line up one way or the other. They often refuse to make tough decisions in life. They demand nothing from others and oftentimes get nothing in return. They accept us for who we are, but they never help us become who we should be. But then there's truth people. See, truth people are easy to admire. They have convictions and principles. They believe in right and wrong. They set standards. They speak out against injustice, oppression, and evil. And oftentimes they're articulate and well-spoken, but without grace, telling the truth can become an excuse for being belligerent. Truth people, without grace, they're loyal to their cause, but they cause us to wonder if they're loyal to us at all. They want to change us and make us better, but they don't allow for mistakes. They're quick to pass judgment on others. They're they make difficult decisions, but they make life difficult for themselves and for others. They can be slow to forgive. And they inspire us with their courage, but they turn us off with their intimidation. See, if you're a grace person, you're most concerned with being loved. And if you're a truth person, you're most concerned with being right, even if it means being unloved. And truthfully, both have their dangers. Something's probably wrong if everybody hates you. 
something might be equally wrong if everybody just loves you. So I used to think of truth and grace, sorry, <laughs> as a pendulum. I have a picture of a pendulum up here too. And on one side of the pendulum's truth, and the other side of the pendulum's grace. And our life is that little ball on a string trying to manage to balance between the two. And I know for a fact I live my life like that pendulum when it comes to this stuff. There are times, depending on the situation or the circumstance or even the relationship, I swing hard on the side of truth. And there are times when all of those same things, circumstance, relationship, all that, I swing hard on the side of grace. And I, I struggle to find that balance. And I was, I was going over what I felt God was leading me with Nathan um, a few weeks ago. And he reminded me that our life's not a pendulum. There's no 50-50 balance of grace and truth. He reminded me to look to Jesus. And in John 1, 14, Scripture says this, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus came full of grace and truth. He had 100% of both. See, when it comes to grace and truth, I don't see a balance in the life of Jesus. He was full, 100% of both. And I don't think we can ever balance things out because we'll never know when we've settled on the halfway mark. And Jesus lived this out in everything he did. And there are multiple stories in the Bible that, that illustrate this, and I chose a couple to look at today. In John 7, 53 through John 8, 1 through 11, we read a story of a woman caught in the act of adultery. And it says this, They went each to his own house, but again Jesus went to, or, but Jesus went to the, house, or the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in their midst. They said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test them, that they might have some charge to bring against him. And Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go. And from now, from now on, sin no more. Now, I know my, my friend and my, my fellow elder, um, Evan, I uh, spoke on this next passage at length about six weeks ago. Um, but I think it also illustrates how Jesus was 100% truth and grace. And the next story comes from John chapter 4. I'm not going to read it from Scripture because, like I said, Evan tackled it about six weeks ago. But the gist of the story is this. Jesus is in the town of Samaria, and it's noon, it's hot out, he's tired, and he's thirsty. And he's sitting beside a well, and a woman approaches the well to get water. Now, the immediate observation is that she has come to the well at noon. See, most women would have come early in the morning or in the early evening because it would have been cooler out, much more tolerable for this type of activity. But she's clearly chosen a time when she'd be left alone, suggesting that maybe she's the town's pariah. She's experienced judgment, she's been ostracized at this well, and she's learned her lesson. And Jesus asks her to draw some water from, for him to drink. And they start having a discussion, and he shares with her that he has living water, that whoever drinks it will never be thirsty again. And she tells him, I want this living water. And Jesus looks at her, and he says, go get your husband and come back with him. And she says to Jesus, I don't have a husband. And he tells her he knows that. He knows that she's had five husbands already, and the man that she's living with now isn't her husband either. They're just shacking up together. That's not Jesus' words, that's mine. And after further discussion, Jesus reveals that he is the Messiah and she's been hearing, that she's been hearing about and waiting, about, waiting for her whole life. See, at Bridgetown Church of Christ, we believe in Jesus. We preach about Jesus. We strive to live lives that are like Jesus. We strive to glorify God through living this way and sharing the story of who Jesus is with others who don't know him yet and with those who do. We share that story through our actions, living a life that's an example of Jesus to others and through our words telling others about how Jesus has changed our lives. And that Jesus that we believe in, that we preach about, that we strive to be like and share with others was full of truth and grace, 100% full of both. That's the Jesus we strive to be like. So that begs the question, how do we do that? Well, firstly, we have to live in truth. You look at both of these stories, and in either case did Jesus shy away from sharing the truth with these women. He called both of them out in their sin, and he made it clear that he knew what their sin was. In the story of the woman caught in adultery, he says to her, from now on, sin no more. He doesn't say, you know what? You made a mistake. It happens. 
Have a good day, right? He tells her that while he isn't condemning her, she very publicly committed sin. There's no denying what happened here today. But he tells her in no uncertain terms, stop sinning. He speaks the truth into her life and makes it clear that she is living outside of God's will and plan and living in sin. And similarly, when speaking to the Samaritan woman at the well, he makes it clear that how she has been and is currently living is outside of God's will and plan as she is living in sin. See, there's something really sharp about the truth. I teach fourth graders, so I'm very familiar with the temptation to lie. Not me, the, the kids I teach. I, I assure you. There's, there's this obvious sense of trying to get out of trouble for one thing, right? But what I found is when, this, when the truth's spoken, it changes the whole conversation. See, kids, they have drama, they cheat, they lie, they call each other names, whatever the case may be, right? And my style as a teacher is generally to gather up those involved in whatever the drama is and take them out in the hall and then kind of get their side of the story, what happened. And then after a couple of minutes of going around in circles, I've done it a thousand times, I'm about to enter my 18th year of teaching, 13th and 4th grade alone, I've done it a thousand times. I just cut to the heart of the issue. Listen, you lied, you cheated, you called them a name, you did this, right? Whatever the situation is. And nine times out of ten, there's always that one, but nine times out of ten, the kid or kids will hang their heads and go, yeah, that's, that's, that's what happened, right? And it's like the disappointment really sets in when the truth is called out. When they're told the truth, they kind of have to sit there and take it. And once I call them out on whatever the situation is, you know, we talk about why what they did was wrong and what steps they can take to make repairment on it. And there's tears, they cry, depending on the day I cry. It just depends. Not really. Well, sometimes. <laughs> And, you know, we go on with our lives, and then 30 minutes later, I've got another group of kids out in the hall, and I'm doing it again. Well, maybe not that bad, but, you know. But there's something about the truth that makes people uncomfortable, whether it's owning the fact you did something, feeling that disappointment or disapproval from the person calling you out, being angry that you got caught in this situation. See, Jesus was clear about the truth, even if it was unpopular, even when it caused crowds to scatter. At the very end of John chapter 6, we read that Jesus is talking to a large crowd of people, many of them calling themselves his disciples. And he's sharing with them the truth of who he is, the bread of life, the only way to the Father. And in John 6, 60 to 61, it says, When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to him, Do you take offense to this? And he continues to speak the truth about who he is, that the Spirit gives life, the flesh is no help. And then we read this in verse 66. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. And Jesus, he's left with the 12 disciples that we know from Scripture. And he turns to them and he says, are you guys going to leave too? And Peter, he responds for all of them and he says, where are we going to go? We know you have the words of eternal life and that you are the Holy One of God. In other words, we, we know you're speaking the truth. And the truth is scary to some, but we have to speak it. To those who don't know Jesus, they need to know. They need to know to have the truth of Jesus shared with them. And to those who do know and follow Jesus, sometimes there's a need for correction and, and to be shown the error of their ways as they step away from the truth and listen to false teachers who claim to be teaching the truth. That's how we uphold the truth. But secondly, we have to live in grace. So again, look at both these stories where Jesus interacted with these women. He not only spoke the truth to them, but he showed love and compassion to these people. He corrected both women of these stories, but he wasn't overbearing. He wasn't unkind in presenting the truth. To the woman caught in, adult in the act of adultery, he acknowledged that she'd sinned. And in truth, he called out the rest of the crowd as well, making it clear they too were sinners. And when the crowd left, he asks her where everybody went. He says, has no one condemned you? And she tells him, no, no one's condemned her. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. And I looked up the word condemn because I was really curious about what it actually meant. And to condemn means to express complete disapproval of, typically in public, to censure. And so he still corrects her by telling her to stop sinning. But he doesn't beat her over the head about it. He doesn't allow her sin to define her or her worth to him. He doesn't completely disapprove her and say, I'm done. There's nothing I can do for you. And in the case of the second story, the woman at the well, he speaks to this woman. He knows everything there is to know about her. He, he shows her, I know everything there is to know about you. And I love you and I accept you, and I offer you this living water, me. He knows that she's a sinner. He knows that she comes to the well at the hottest part of the day to avoid judgment, judgmental glances and words from other people. He knows that she has tried to fill an emptiness in her life with men and sex, and she's still empty. But he's offering her the opportunity at a new life 
in him despite her sin. Yes, she needs to repent and turn away of the sin, but Jesus offers her that opportunity and his love, and he offers his love even though she's living in sin. It's through his grace that he's able to present the truth to her. And that whole thing I do as a teacher with my students to get down to the bottom of things, to the truth, I do that. But as much as possible, I don't beat them over the head. I don't yell and scream. I try to approach each child with grace and compassion and love. And believe me, when it's the same kid five times a day, it gets really hard. I point out the truth. I do. And it's sharp and it's cutting sometimes, but I do my very best. And not perfectly, don't get me wrong, to do it in love. I don't hold it over their heads and remind them often of what they did. I I try to gently and lovingly redirect them by speaking the truth, but not in a way that turns them away. Even that story I touched on at the end of John chapter 6, there's no indication that Jesus is being abusive or abrasive in how he's speaking to these people. It's not his tone, his voice, or his attitude that's causing the crowds to scatter. It's the truth of his words, not how he delivered those words that caused the crowds to scatter. And too often today, I'm afraid... It's how our words are delivered to others inside and outside of the church that cause them to not want to hear the truth we have to offer through Jesus. It goes back to that commercial I showed at the beginning. We can't just disagree with someone. We have to do it in such a way that shows that we're right. We've lost the ability to speak the truth in love. And finally, truth and grace need to work in tandem. See, an emphasis on grace alone can dissipate into a shallow and sentimental foundation where justice or truth are discarded. But at the same time, a focus on truth alone can devolve into a cold, hardened dogma. And Jesus' character demonstrates the perfect balance of both grace and truth. He is full of both. We've been studying the book of 1 Timothy for the past several weeks, and in that, we've seen how we're to operate as a church. We've seen that we have order and purpose as God has designed it. And the church with order and direction lives in the backdrop of a world lacking order, lacking direction. And as followers of Jesus, we're called to be Jesus to the world around us, to present the truth and do so in love. In the Old Testament, in the book of Judges, the very last verse of that book, Judges 21, 25, says this. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Doesn't that sound like the world that we live in today? Everyone does what's right in his or her own eyes. Cancel culture, political correctness, the truth is relative. I know that commercial was a joke, but that's how we disagree in America today. Your opinion is not the same as mine, we're done. I refuse to listen to your point of view unless you you start seeing it my way. I'm right, you're wrong. And the truth, the truth of Jesus, the truth of scripture is consistently being canceled. It's not politically correct in today's climate. And we know the one and only truth, it's not relative, it's not conditional, it's not subjective, it's not varying, and it's changing over time. It is the absolute truth, it's consistent and eternal. And yet we fight this battle not only outside of the church with unbelievers, but sometimes with our own brothers and sisters inside of the church. And I think often our temptation, I know mine has been over the years, to set off truth TNT and burn others to the ground. I don't think that peanut commercial was that far off. I think, though, we're called to go above and beyond as Christ followers. We're called to protect and defend the truth. That's that's absolutely no question about that. But to do so in a way that honors the other person and shows humility and weakness and meekness, sorry, on our part. And that ultimately shows the other person love despite disagreement. In 1 Peter 3.15 it says, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. It's how we're called to present the truth to an unknowing world where everyone does what is right in his or her own eyes. Be prepared to share the truth of Jesus, the reason for the hope that's in us, but do it in gentleness and respect, not with a heart full of self-righteousness. Think of the people in your life that don't know Jesus and need to know him. Is there anything more loving that you or I can do than to show them the truth of who Jesus is and loving them and walking with them as they figure this out. This week, this is improvised. I didn't even have this in here. This week I'm doing a neighborhood Bible club at my house and some people from the church are coming to help and I've invited my neighbors and I've got some, a couple of commitments from people and I, I get the opportunity to show some kids and their families, hopefully, Jesus. It's an unknowing world out there. And that's exciting and it's scary. But I'm going to do my best to, to be gentle and respectful in, in sharing that truth. But it's going to be the truth. I, I agree with that. In Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, it says this, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints 
for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the, me- the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head and to Christ from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is properly, working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. See, Jesus established these offices, the positions in the church, the positions or offices of apostles and evangelists, shepherds, teachers, and pastors. And he did this so the body of Christ could be built up, matured and strengthened here in the church. And there are those in the church, in the body, that have not yet matured. And frankly, there are some that have regressed in their faith. And they're being swayed and carried by false doctrine, the cunning flashiness and charisma of false teachers, the craftiness and scheming of the world. And we're called to speak the truth to these brothers and sisters in love. When they're straying, when they're being deceived, this is how we're called to relate to one another in God's family. Reminding and guiding our misguided brothers and sisters in the truth of God's word, but to do so in love. See, I've been told this, and I've experienced this in my own life. We love our brothers and sisters in Christ well when we speak the truth to them in love. When we come alongside them and speak the truth, and we humble ourselves and share with them lovingly the places they've misstepped, the places where there's unresolved, unrepentant sin in their lives. When we can lovingly speak the truth about areas of of our brothers and sisters' lives that they have yet to hand over to Jesus, we're loving them well, while, while equally speaking the truth into their lives. And the truth is I've missed so many opportunities, ignored so many promptings. I'm admitting I have ignored promptings from the Holy Spirit to do this, to love my brothers and sisters well because I didn't want to ruffle feathers. I knew the truth, but I was afraid to speak it. And the thing of it is, some of the most beautiful and memorable and God-present, Holy Spirit-moving moments of my life have come when I've taken that step to say, I love you enough to, to share with you. This is an area of your life that you need to hand over to God. I've been loved well when I've had people speak into my life and say, Mike, this is an area of your life that you are not living for Jesus. It's hard. (laughs) It's really hard. And it's scary. And there's going to probably be moments when even walking with the person in love, you're never going to ever see eye to eye. And there's a whole different story that comes out of that that I'm, you know, at some point we we do have to draw a line and say, "I, I, you know, I don't know, right? In his book, The Grace and Truth Paradox, Randy Alcorn writes, Truth without grace breeds a self-righteous legalism that poisons the church and pushes the world away from Christ. Grace without truth breeds moral indifference and keeps people from seeing their need for Christ. Attempts to soften the gospel by minimizing truth keep people from Jesus. Attempts to toughen the gospel by minimizing grace keep people from Jesus. It's not enough for us to offer grace or truth. We must offer both. And the reality is, by the grace of God, we can follow the example of Jesus and strive to become full of both. We don't give on truth for the sake of grace. We don't give on grace for the sake of truth. We try to be like Jesus was, as full of both. He was 100% truthful when he pointed out sin. He was 100% gracious and graceful when dealing with sinners and when he died on the cross for our sins. It's very much a different way to talk and think about things, and it's going to be a challenge. And like I said, I feel like this is what God challenged. It's challenging my own heart, personally. And I'm letting it spill out here for all of you to hear that too. This is what we need to be challenged to do. I heard this quote recently that has kind of become my, my personal approach um, on how I'm trying to do all this. Uh, N.T. Wright is an English New Testament scholar. He's been called the C.S. Lewis of our time. He's a very, very bright man. I listen to a podcast he does called Ask N.T. Wright Anything. And discussing how to handle differing opinions with others, particularly inside the church, he said this for Christ followers. The aim should be to live in such a way that doesn't make demands on one another's conscience, but may make demands on one another's charity. In other words, I shouldn't be beating anybody over the head with the truth, forcing it down their throats. I am called to speak the truth to others, those that know and those that don't. There's no doubt about that, but it's not my job to to force anybody to change their hearts or minds. That's God's job and he does it very well without my interference but I should live in such a way that when I disagree with someone else I can be gracious and loving towards them and continue that dialogue and continue that journey with them and walk with them despite disagreement and yeah maybe the road comes to an end at some point we never agree to agree we agree to disagree for the rest of our lives I I don't know how all this works I'm learning too 
here's the thing. I want to get really practical and real here as I finish this message. And I debated going here. I really did. And I was encouraged by a couple of friends to take this step, to take this, me- this message from here to here. I have, a, I have a family member, a very, very close family member um, in my life. And about 15 years ago, he opened up to me that he's a homosexual. And uh, he's living with a partner of several years. And he's embraced this lifestyle. And uh, hit the rewind button about 15 years ago when it happened. I had a two-year-old daughter. Hadn't had my, uh, my two boys yet. And my plan for my family, my decision, I, you can ask my wife, I told her this, is we're done. I'm not engaging in this relationship any further. I'm not allowing my family to participate in this relationship. Not happening. And the truth is, still today, my firm belief on the truth is that God's design was laid out in Genesis. When he created man and woman and he joined them together, in Genesis 2.24 it says, God said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. That's the truth that I know from Scripture. And that's where I anchor myself. That was and is God's design for relationships and marriage. And I spoke with this person years ago when this first happened. And I, and I beat him over the head with truth. And I tried to force truth down his throat. I, didn't make, I made demands on his conscience and I didn't allow for any demands on my own charity. And the truth is it caused a major divide. We didn't speak regularly for a long time. The subject of church and faith were quickly thwarted and thrown out the window for a long, long time. You see, I was so determined to present the truth and swing so far on the the truth side of the pendulum that I neglected grace. And my wise and loving friend Nathan, uh, we were talking about this 15 years ago when it happened, and and he shared with me that he, he had a person in his life that was living a homosexual relationship as well. And this person was dying, and it was Nathan and his wife, Nikki, that were going to visit with this person in his dying days. And I remember calling Nathan out. I remember sitting in my kitchen saying to him, what in the world are you doing, Nathan? You know better than this. You know the truth. I'll never forget his words. He said, Mike, if I don't show this person Jesus, if I don't go and make this effort to show this person the truth of Jesus, who is going to give him the opportunity to learn the hope that Jesus offers. Who's, who's going to speak this truth to his life if I don't take this step of grace? He chose to act in grace to present the truth. He chose to follow the example of Jesus and to strive to become full of truth and grace. So I had a decision to make. And I prayed and I thought and I wrestled and I talked to people. Frankly, I talked to a lot of people I wanted to hear my point of view on it from. And I prayed some more and I read some more and I talked to some more people. And I could stand here 15 years later in front of you and say, I have a relationship with this person. It's been restored. And I, and I love him, and I love his partner. I really do. And they both know full well where, where I stand on this. They know the truth that I anchor myself in. They know the truth that I live in as a Christ follower. And we've, we've had this conversation. I've shared the truth that they are living outside of God's design, outside of God's will. That this, isn't, this is a sinful behavior that they're living in. But... They also know that I love them and I'm willing to engage in this relationship with them regardless of of knowing that truth and sharing that truth. And they're willing to engage in this relationship with me because I've learned to show grace. See, see this person in my life and, 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 and his partner, they've had the opportunity for years now and they're going to continue to have the opportunity for years now to see Jesus to have the opportunity to know the hope that Jesus offers because myself and and my my family and people in my life that that are a part of this with them, we're not giving on grace for the sake of truth. That's true. But we're also not giving on truth for the sake of grace. We We are walking this out gracefully and loving them as best we can. And we're presenting the truth throughout the whole thing. And, and I can say this, this person has not seen things any differently at this point, but we're still there. The engagement is still there, and I, I attribute this completely to the fact that I took that step to say, all right, God, I'm going to lead with grace and, and create the opportunity to be there because me banging them over the head with truth is not, it's not getting us anywhere. And, and truthfully, I'd love to tell you I'm doing this 100% of the time in all these circumstances. Every time I'm with this person or with people in my life that I don't see eye to eye on, I, I'm walking it out perfectly, and that's just not the truth. It's just not true. I don't know how any of this looks most of the time. All I know is that I'm trying 
And I'm choosing to follow the example of Jesus and striving to become full of truth and grace. And it's really hard. Some of you may know what I'm talking about. Some of you have no idea. It's hard. But it's possible. It is possible. We sang earlier a song that said, there's nothing that our God can't do. And that's the truth. There's nothing that our God can't do. If you're struggling to defend and speak the truth, there's nothing that our God can't do. And he'll give you the words and the courage to speak the truth in those situations. If you're struggling to be gracious towards others you disagree with, there's nothing that our God can't do. He will soften your heart without softening the truth and give you the courage to love that other person. Because see, that's what, I, that's what I, I've come to is that's what real love is. Loving someone enough to show them the truth. Loving them enough to say, I care so much about you and your soul and your salvation that I'm willing to speak the truth to you. But I love you enough to do it in such a way where I'm, I'm going to do it in love and not beat you over the head with it. Let's pray. God, I, I thank you for uh, your truth. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your example of being 100% full of truth and grace. And as we walk this out and as we learn this and we try to figure this out, we're going to make mistakes. I've made a thousand I can think of on both sides. And I'm sure I'll make more. But I pray each of us would strive, would strive to say, I want to be that Jesus that loves others and speaks the truth into their lives and does it because I love them. Move in our hearts. For those that are struggling on the truth side that are saying, I'm swinging heavy on the truth pendulum, show them opportunities to be gracious and, and, and soften their hearts without softening their truth. For those on the side of grace that say, just love everyone. It's all relevant. It doesn't matter. Swing, swing their pendulum harder on the, the truth side. Not even swing, swing their pendulum. Just, just show them to be 100% full of both grace and truth. And show them the truth needs to be spoken to, Father. Be with us as we walk this out, as we figure this out. In Jesus' name. Well, as we reach the end of the message, we enter a time of communion. Communion is something we take together as a family, as the body of Christ each week. We get one of these packets and we take a cracker and we're reminded of Jesus' body, which was broken for us. And we drink some of this juice and we're reminded of Jesus' blood that was spilled for us. The truth is we've all fallen short of God's glory. We're all sinners. Jesus had no problem being 100% truthful in pointing out sins to those that he came in contact with. The Holy Spirit today convicts and points our sins out today, but Jesus was also 100% gracious when he died on the cross for our sins. And he rose again to show us that he defeated sin and death. So take and eat of the bread and remember Christ's body, which was broken. Take and drink of the juice. Remember Christ's blood that was shed for you.